So at, at this point in the talk, I'm, I'm pleased to, to turn the microphone over to Amit Dogen, who is the chief of uh, hematopathology at Memorial Sloan Kettering to go through diagnosis and pathology. Thank you, Amit. That's on. Uh, I'm so impressed with uh, what David and the team uh, for the Castleman's Disease Collaborative Network has achieved within the last uh, two years. Uh, the, the, their enthusiasm and uh, their really insight to the disease is so impressive. And I have learned actually from their efforts uh, uh, to, to really review how I think about uh, Castleman's disease. And they, uh, with various discussions with all of you, actually, for, from time to time, uh, I, I started thinking about the pathology of disease in a different way. And I'll try to share that with you um, in a moment. So the, uh, the, from the pathologist's perspective, uh, the Castleman's disease, of course, defined by the fundamental paper written by the, Dr. Benjamin Castleman in 1950s, and that is still the gold standard. There has not been a sort of a comprehensive review of pathology of this disease since. Uh, so we all refer to that, pa uh, that paper, and, uh, and the, many of the information pathologists have had been handed down from senior to junior, you know, from mentorship. And actually, during this uh, hand down, as you know, with folk stories, the pathology uh, description has uh, uh, diversified so that there is no real uniform pathological criteria for the diagnosis. So we often go back to that original paper to realign ourselves how we are going to diagnose this disease. From my, pers my per perspective, I see this as a, the morphological features of Castleman's disease as a morphological syndrome, as an end result of multiple pathogenetic events. Uh, at one end, we have the uh, a very nice term now we use for defined multi idiopathic multicentric Castleman's disease. That is, we don't know the etiology, but in other uh, events, we, we understand the underlying pathogenesis. From my perspective, again, the hyaline vascular variant is a unique, completely different disease than the plasma cell variant. And I do not use, in my practice, hyaline vascular term for any of the other multicentric Castleman's disease uh, uh, pathogenesis, because hyaline vascular unicentric disease appears to be a very unique entity, very distinct from the multicentric disease. So the, the plasma cell variant may show hyaline vascular follicles, but does not show the global picture of hyaline vascular, typical hyaline vascular Castleman's disease as described by uh, uh, Dr. Castleman himself. So that is really the, one of the issues. People look at the sections of a plasma cell variant, for example, and they, if they see hyaline vascular follicles, they sometimes call it mixed. They may call it uh, hyaline vascular, whereas hyaline vascular is not just the follicles. I'll show you in a moment. It's the global, global picture of the lymph node. It's very different than the, uh, than the plasma cell variant. So that has been one of the confusions. Fortunately, that does not have a you know, pathologist mistake in this area, does not affect the, the overall understanding, because it, you know, it looks like that from the very elegant review that David had done, really the, that, that subclassification does not really matter what matters is unicentric or multicentric. But for my, my, my thinking purposes, I think unicentric and hyaline vascular is the same thing in vast majority of the cases. There are actually a small number of plasma cell variants, so-called, that's unicentric. And the plasma cell variant is typically systemic disease. So those are kind of the, they, they, they go hand in hand. So for, for that reason, when, it, when I look at a lymph node, I, I'm thinking of the, these really five differential diagnoses that I have to go through to, to uh, make the accurate diagnosis. On the top is the, is the unicentric hyaline vascular. That's a completely separate entity. There are rare cases of unicentric plasma cell variant, some of them associated with plasma cell neoplasms. Dr. Jeffy published a paper a couple of years ago, uh, may, maybe suggesting that these are associated with plasma cell neoplasms, localized masses, typically uh, young patients with autoimmune history. 
they are really lymph node uh, plasma cytomas, and they do not have any of the systemic features. So this really maybe should not be diagnosed as uh, plasma cell variant of Castleman's disease. And then we have the three big entities in the multicentric Castleman's disease. One is the pl multicentric Castleman's disease associated with plasma cell, uh, uh, plasma cell neoplasms, in particular poems, and Dr. Dispensieri, of course, has, has written on this. And I have learned a lot from her, from the morphological spectrum of this. In this, of course, this is a sort of a paraneoplastic manifestation of an underlying plasma cell neoplasm. And then the, the, the other two entities that David referred, which forms the bulk of the cases uh, of multicentric calcium disease, SUHVA associated and idiopathy. So those are the kind of five things that I go through my differential diagnosis. Some of them may require, especially in this area where you, you, you are not sure what you are, is there just a reactive lymph node with plasma cells or calcium disease, clinical picture is extremely important. So if you look at the hyaline vascular pathology, so this is really the typical appearance of hyaline vascular uh, Castleman's disease. The, first of all, the lymph node architecture is completely effaced. You may, I mean, even in many cases, you are not, one is not sure whether this represents a lymph node or not. Uh, there are no sinuses. There are these expanded follicles which show uh, these uh, regressive changes, which is the term hyaline vascular comes from. So they are hyalinized and vascularized follicle centers. But there are distinct features here with these follicles. First of all, they are not really single standing follicles, but they are budding follicles. So there is a, uh, there is a architectural distortion of the lymph node. And the, the biological evidence suggests that actually these are maybe driven by a neoplastic stromal cell, maybe follicular dendritic cell that it's essentially a benign tumor of, if you like, uh, stromal cells, possibly follicular dendritic cells. And th this is the proliferation that mimics. And there are markedly expanded uh, mantle zones and very sclerotic interfollicular area. So th that is really the hallmark of disease. And uh, you can see, again, this is the kind of the hyaline vascular appearance, but th appreciate the very thick mantle zone uh, and, uh, uh, and the, this plastic cells that are associated with, the, with the, those follicles, possibly these are the proliferating neoplastic cells that are that's giving this tumor. So I see this almost like a, maybe a hamartoma or a clonal proliferation of follicular dendritic cells, and a subset of these actually go and develop follicular dendritic cell sarcoma. So there is, it is a precursor lesion, maybe a high-grade sarcoma that may arise from this background. So this is a very, very distinct entity, and so that's why I don't want to use the hyaline vascular term outside the context of unicentric Castleman's disease. Young patients, usually mediastinal, mesentric mass, sometimes axillary neck, uh, usually centrally located, uh, could get very big. Some cases actually may show, uh, I'll skip these, uh, uh, may show plasma cell infiltrates in the long term, but it doesn't change the diagnosis into a plasma cell variant. I still think it's a, it's a hyaline vascular variant, and these may have inflammatory syndromes if the mass is very big, but excision often is curative in this case. So that's very different. So that's, I think, one of the confusions in the field. I'll skip the, uh, uh, so we, in, in contrast, if you look at a typical case of an idiopathic Castleman's disease, what you get is essentially, again, maybe a partial effacement of the architecture, but you can recognize this is immediately as a, as a lymph node. There are sinuses open around, uh, full of histiocytes. Follicles are less prominent and the, the interfollicular area is much expanded. There is vascularity here, and, uh, and the, the, those vessels are associated with a dense plasmacytic infiltrate, appreciated in high power. You can see the, that hyaline vascular change in the follicle, that's indistinguishable, but the follicular architecture is very different. So that's why this is not a hyaline vascular. Although the follicle itself shows hyaline vascular changes, as we see over there, the architecture is very, very different. So this is like a normal lymph node with a lot of plasma cells, essentially. That's what we are seeing. And that marked plasmacytic infiltrate in between. And uh, by immunohistochemistry, you can pick up the follicles scattered around. This is the paracortex, which is expanded. And then if you look with light chains, these are typically, of course, polyclonal. And, and, and this is a, really an end result of an inflammatory process. And in, in, in idiopathic Castleman's disease, we don't know what the etiology is. In contrast, uh, uh, the uh, HHPA, the associated Castleman's disease, has similar features. Uh, the interfollicular areas often contain 
uh, uh, plasma cells. Follicles may be more reactive, more hyperplastic, but you can see those hyaline vascular changes. If you look at the literature, you'll see many hyaline vascular, uh, many HHV associated carcinoma disease diagnosed as hyaline vascular variant. That is really nonsensical to me. That's a mistake. That should never happen. You know, this, this disease has an objective diagnosis. It doesn't matter a single follicle has hyaline vascular appearances. Overall architecture, as you can appreciate, very different. Marked vascularity associated with the uh, uh, typical case of uh, hyaline vascular. You can see these, uh, so the uh, uh, HHV8 associated, you can see these vascular proliferations. <coughs> And you can pick up these, you know, hyaline vascular follicles, but again, this doesn't make it into hyaline vascular variant. That is part of the HHV associated multicentric carcinoma disease. Uh, often, you know, if you want to subtype it, it's best to subtype it as a plasmoblastic or plasma, plasma, uh, plasma cell variant. And you can appreciate, again, sheets of uh, plasma cells, and in this power, perhaps you'll be able to see scattered immunoblasts in the mantle zone. So often, you know, the, this is morphology tells me immediately when I see this kind of expanded mantle zone with these plasma blasts that it is actually HHV8 associated. I don't even have to do the immunohistochemistry in vast majority of the case. We do it, of course, because that's, we need it documented, but actually it's such a distinctive morphology that it's easily recognizable. And the interfolicular areas show plasma cytosis. Let me skip these. And often this is associated with Carson disease. The striking feature is that with HHV8 stain, you see this is the follicle center. These, uh, these uh, plasma blasts that I was indicating, they are positive for HHV8. And if you look with light chains, uh, what you see that, uh, so in, in kappa, you can see that interfollicular plasma cells are polytypic. And then within the follicle, you don't see any light chain expression. If you look at here, again, interfollicular cells are plasma polytypic, but those HHV8 positive plasma cells are lambda light chain restricted. And that's another hallmark of the disease. Although they are lambda light chain restricted, they are polyclonal at the genetic level. And we don't know why, why this happens, but there is some clue maybe to the biology here because also Poems disease associated with, uh, uh, Cosmos disease associated with Poems disease often driven by a lambda light chain restricted plasma cell neoplasm. So there is maybe some, some interesting observation there to look at what, why, why the reason for that is. Maybe the cytokine milieu leads to lambda light chain restricted plasma cell expansion, uh, and in this instance, it is, it is uh, uh, polyclonal. So that is really the characteristic of HHV. So those are, the, those are the main things. So going back to our table, really, when we are looking at the, 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 the main di differential diagnosis from the pathology, the main problematic areas is the difference between hyaline vascular and plasma cell variant, which may not be clinically very significant, because clinical features tell you if it's multicentric, you don't care what we call it, essentially. You, you know, clinicians will, will approach it appropriately. But, uh, but hyaline vascular terms should not be used for multicentric disease. And then within the idiopathic, because idiopathic does not have any objective uh, diagnostic marker, and the spectrum could be quite variable, and the straightforward diagnosis, unlike, for example, hyaline vascular, poems associated, or HHV8, positive uh, Carlson's disease, which I can give you a positive diagnosis. For idiopathic, we can only say, you know, suggestive because we've ruled out all those. If the clinical picture fits, it could be, it could be a Carlson's disease. If it doesn't fit, it could be just a reactive lymph node. So that is the kind of the difficulty. We don't have a marker for the idiopathic malcentric Carlson's disease. Unlike, you know, when I talk to clinicians, they want us to tell, you know, as if I can make a diagnosis of follicle lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, objectively, and you guys uh, run with it. I, it's, it, with the idiopathic mouse centric Carlson disease, it is a, it, really a clinical pathological diagnosis. It cannot really be made. We can rule out all those possibilities. It cannot be made in isolation by pathology. It has to be a clinical pathological diagnosis because, uh, as David very elegantly indicated, this is, a, this is an end, end result of an inflammatory syndrome. And depending on what kind of interventions patient has taken, what kind of natural history the patient has had, how long the disease has, has been, the morphology varies dramatically. So it requires that, you know, we can say, yeah, you know, this may be a regressing Carlson disease, this may be a coming up Carlson disease, do another biopsy. You know, that kind of communication is essential to reach the accurate diagnosis, and it has to be a clinical pathological diagnosis. It can't be a morphological diagnosis. So I think that's kind of my, my take on this, uh, and uh, we'll take questions uh, later, I think, at the end, yeah. Okay, thank you.